just ahead on Tempo in Depth. When you look at the leading causes of death in the United States, what do they all have in common? Smoking. Heart disease, cancer, respiratory disease, and stroke all have links to smoking. Reports show 440,000 people die prematurely in the United States due to cigarette smoking each and every year. Yet thousands of young people pick up the habit every day. We'll share stories from cancer survivors and meet the people in our community who help others quit smoking and prevent them from starting in the first place. It all starts right now on Tempo In Depth. The people of Air Products feel privileged to bring this programming to you. By supporting education and the arts, Air Products strives to improve the quality of life here in the Lehigh Valley, where we call home. You're safe at home at Luther Crest, a Diacon senior living community in Allentown. Our mission is to offer premier accommodations and services so residents can cultivate a healthy and fulfilling retirement. At Luther Crest, we offer independent living apartments and cottages, personal care, skilled nursing, rehabilitative services, and more. Plus, the Luther Crest team strives to provide each person family like support. You might say it's like a home run. Luther Crest. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. Now, the Surgeon General lists tobacco as the leading cause of preventable death in the United States, and smoking causes one in every five deaths. Each day, more than 3,800 young people under age 18 smoke their very first cigarette. More than 1,000 of those become daily smokers. Decades later, reports show that about half of all smokers will learn they have lung cancer. Doctors report it's the second leading cause of death in the United States, and until recently, there was no way to catch it early. Tempo in Depth's Laura McHugh shares the latest research. That's a double word score. When I sat down to a game of Scrabble with Judy Russo, I had no idea what I was in for. 1450. During the past few years, the 61-year-old Forks Township resident has developed into quite the talented player. You know, when I um, first came home uh, after I had the surgery, that's when I started playing Scrabble online. Throughout 2010 and 2011, this former pack-a-day smoker found comfort in the game as she recovered from a dreaded diagnosis. I was in the emergency room in a little cubicle by myself, and uh, he said, you have lung cancer. You know, your whole life flashes in front of you. Of course, I'm mainly thinking about my son. Though she showed no typical symptoms, Judy's family doctor noticed swelling around her fingertips and sent her for screening. And when we have somebody who's Judy's age, who's a longtime smoker, who's got a mask that looks like that, that's hot on the PET scan, that'll be lung cancer 99 times out of 100 or more. In the operating room, Dr. Bill Burfing, chief of thoracic surgery at St. Luke's University Health Network, removed half of Judy's right lung and a tumor the size of two golf balls. After that, Judy spent five months in chemotherapy to treat stage one lung cancer. As as a thoracic surgeon, you'd probably say that it'd be unlikely she'd be alive in one to two years if her disease went untreated. And the tough thing about lung cancer is it's generally painless. Symptoms like a chronic cough, constant chest pain, shortness of breath, frequent lung infections, and coughing up blood don't usually show up until lung cancer has progressed to later stages. According to the American Cancer Society, when lung cancer is diagnosed early, the five-year survival rates climb from 16 to 52 percent, but they also report only 15 percent of cases are found in those early stages. The American Cancer Society estimates 226,000 people will be diagnosed with lung cancer this year. More than 160,000 will die from it, making it the single leading cause of cancer death in the United States. So although breast cancer is more common in women, lung cancer is much more deadly. And and the same thing is true in men where prostate cancer is more common, uh, but uh, it's uh, not unheard of, but it's rare to die of prostate cancer now, and it's super common to die of lung cancer. 
It accounts for more deaths than breast, prostate, and colon cancers combined. But unlike those cancers, until recently, no screenings proved to diagnose it early enough to save lives. According to Dr. Burfiend, new research now proves that low-dose CT scans can detect lung cancers early and reduce the chance of dying from it by 20%. Here we're using CT technology where we can see nodules that are two and three millimeters in size. Uh, and so we can follow them very closely and the ones that grow, they can be removed. And if, we, if we're able to remove stage one, the earliest stage lung cancer, you've got a much higher chance of being cured from the disease. Since most insurance companies don't cover the scans, St. Luke's offers low-dose CT scans to people at risk for developing lung cancer at a reduced price of $49. Barb Bieber of the Cancer Society's local chapter says early detection is key. She also stresses prevention by working with people to quit smoking or just never start in the first place. And really it's the best choice you can make. Um, a third of all cancers could be eliminated if we could just get people to quit smoking. In fact, 80 to 90 percent of lung cancer cases are linked to smoking, and about half of all smokers will be diagnosed with it. While tobacco use is directly related to cancers of the lung, mouth, throat, and respiratory and digestive systems, Barb explains smokers are at a higher risk for most cancers. By smoking, they're putting themselves at risk for every other cancer because the, uh, the smoking, the exposure to those carcinogens, weakens the immune system. And so the body can't respond to a cell that's, you know, becoming cancerous. Tobacco cessation counselor Elizabeth Bell offers these tips to help quit. First, identify your triggers and try to avoid them. Next, share your goals with friends and family. And finally, ask yourself why you're quitting. She says health reasons rank as the number one motivation. According to the Surgeon General, smoking is the number one cause of preventable death in the United States. And it's responsible for over 440,000 deaths annually in the United States. So health reasons is a big um, concern, big motivating factor. Hi, Judy. How are you? Judy had a huge reason to quit. Her life depended on it. Now more than two years after her diagnosis, she remains both smoke-free and cancer-free. Uh, your CAT scan that you just had looks great. Uh, there's no sign of any new nodules or uh, problems in your lungs. All the lymph nodes look normal to me, normal size. There's no sign of any uh, recurrent cancer on it. Both Judy and Dr. Burfing hope that for this patient, early detection spells out not just a win at Scrabble, but a victory over cancer. For Tempo in Depth, I'm Laura McHugh reporting. Thanks so much, Laura. Well, I'm joined now by Alice Dallapalu, the Executive Director of Tobacco Free Northeast PA, and her good friend, Christine Brader. Christine started smoking at the age of 16 and in 2007 was diagnosed with oral cancer. Thanks so much for being with us, ladies. We appreciate it. Christine, we got to talk a little bit about your story. It's quite scary. Yes, I was first diagnosed in 2007. Um, I had been smoking about a pack a day for almost 28 years. And when I was diagnosed, I didn't know what to do, and I was still smoking. I just quit cold turkey. That was it. You had children at yes. home at the time. Teenagers? Yes. Teenagers, and I had no caregiver. So it was very hard going through chemo of radiation that first round. But you had three rounds. The cancer came back three different times and, and left you with very challenging side effects. Yes. The first time I was... Um, cured with chemo and radiation. A year later I came back and it was surgery. At that point I still looked fine. The third round though was a round that almost did me in. My chances of survival were very slim and my doctor told me to get my affairs in order, which I did. I prepared to die. Um, my jaw needed to be removed and a titanium plate was put in but the operation failed. I ended up in a medically induced coma for three weeks, and I, it was a two-month stay in the hospital. It was a very long journey for recovery. It took me a whole year. Um, I had never even heard of oral cancer before, so I was pretty shocked. 
devastating. And now, that's how, kind of how you and Alice got to be friends. You mm -hmm. share your story with students in schools all over the region to try and help them. The message is don't start so you don't have to deal with the devastating effects. Alice, talk to us a little bit about your organization and how you educate people. Sure, Amy. Thank you for letting me be here today. Um, Tobacco Free Northeast has the contract with the Department of Health, and we cover the 10 counties in the Northeast Health District. So we subcontract out services for tobacco treatment, like with St. Luke's, uh, and with other agencies throughout the district. We also do prevention programs within the schools and within the community, and also policy initiatives, to, um, which really impacts youth the most. Um, having smoke-free policies uh, within the community, with work sites, with schools, with playgrounds, recreation areas, um, creates a social norming, as we refer to it, meaning that tobacco use is not common amongst youth, and that's really important to communicate that to youth. But have the smoke-free policies reduced the number of young people Picking up the habit? Yes, for a time that was true. Um, in the late 2000s, from 2005 through 2008, 9, we were seeing reductions in youth smoking as well as with adult smoking. And they're linked because if uh, youth are surrounded by smokers in their families or in the community, they think it's okay to smoke and they start picking the problem it up. How many kids think it's cool? Yes. I mean, so many. Why did you start, Christine? Peer pressure. Peer pressure. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of the reasons perhaps kids think it's cool is tobacco companies are rather savvy about the products they produce to kind of attract young people to them. Tell us a little Absolutely. about those. Absolutely. Well, the tobacco companies create these little starter products, we refer to them, orbs and, and all kinds of products that contain nicotine that can be attractive to kids. Kind and we as like adults, absolutely. And we as adults, we don't even notice them. You know, we don't notice the advertising in stores that tobacco companies pay uh, small grocers or even large chains to put up ads. Um, the FDA is now um, employing states as well as us to go around and, and track those ads to make sure that kids aren't affected or that they have some data to prove that kids are affected by those ads. So we do compliance checks with youth to make sure merchants aren't selling to them, but we also do prevention programs in schools like with Christine, and we're really fortunate that she lives in our community. Uh, she actually travels around the state. Uh, she's part of the Centers for Disease Control for, uh, Tips from Former Smokers campaign, and uh, we're just very lucky to have her here. Very lucky indeed, Christina, is to be here and to have survived battling it so very uh, strongly absolutely. three different times. Absolutely, and everybody thinks it's going to happen to somebody else. And when I go out to the schools, I tell the kids, just don't even start because you think it's going to happen to the other guy. I'm the other guy. And they could be too. Yes. Before we wrap things up, Alice, kind of give us the final word. What can parents do to try and help to avoid these devastating outcomes? I mean, you're the lucky one. It's a devastating effect, but you're still here to be with your kids and hopefully see your grandkids someday. Right. Having smoke-free policies in the workplace and in playgrounds is very important, and we encourage communities to do that as well as in multi-unit housing. But we also encourage parents not to smoke around their children if they do smoke, to not do it outside specifically because of secondhand smoke effects. We also encourage them to consider quitting, and if they're having difficulty quitting, talk to their children about how difficult it is to quit so that children understand that this is just not something you do when you grow up. Um, we have to denormalize tobacco use so that children don't think that this is something you do when you become an adult and it's more attractive to them. You're more grown up to say no than That's to say right. yes. Exactly. Ladies, thank you so much for sharing great information and for sharing your story. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. Well, quit smoking and you dramatically improve your health. On average, smokers die 14 years earlier than non-smokers. If you're a smoker, now is the best time to quit. The question is always how. Tempo and Depths Grover Socox takes us to the Smoking Cessation Lab at Lehigh Valley Health Network. Quitters never win, and winners never quit. So the popular saying goes. But when it comes to giving up cigarettes, quitters win big time. It's a big adjustment. You're going from a full pack, now you're down to three quarters of the pack. So we're slowly getting to that 
goal of 10. Matt Morey smoked his first cigarette at 16. At 39, he's determined to smoke his last for himself, his wife Laura, and their three children. A couple months ago, he began the smoking cessation program at Lehigh Valley Health Network in Allentown. It's a taper-off program. Yes, you reduce the amount of cigarettes you smoke every day. Matt meets with his counselor, Crystal Dulishan, every other week to set, note, and discuss goals. He was so worried about setting himself up for failure. And you know, well, let's start slow. When you get your pack of cigarettes, you take one out right away, toss it in the garbage. And we'll do that for two weeks. So now you're down to 19 a day. Next two weeks, let's work on taking two out. Other two weeks, Let's talk, work on taking three out. People who smoke subconsciously smoke, and they have to learn to not subconsciously smoke. You, you have to think about each cigarette that you take. On this day, Matt regrets a lapse in which he smoked a whole pack. Sunday was the day that, that uh, everything was out the window when I went to, uh, got together with some friends for a Super Bowl party, and that was one of the main triggers, I think, was seeing old friends. The goal is for next occasion, you have a different coping skill in place that you don't need to run back to smoking. Matt echoes some of the strategies Crystal shared with him. Go for a walk instead of, you know, going outside for, for a cigarette and just little things to change your, your lifestyle. Cravings last four to six minutes. For some, they can last up to 10, just depending on how much they've been smoking. So you want to do things for 10 minutes and distract yourself. Matt's goal now is to get down to 10 cigarettes a day. Once there, he might try using a nicotine patch or some other product along with counseling. There's patches, there's lozenges, and there's gums. And they all have their advantages. Physicians can also prescribe medications for nicotine withdrawal. What works best depends on the person. Any kind of anxiety, uh, something negative would happen, Something like that would trigger me, and I'll just, you know, oh, I'm upset or whatever, and just, I need a cigarette. Pamela Rouse kicked a 27-year smoking habit about three months ago after six weeks of counseling with Crystal. With Pamela, what we worked on was starting her on a patch because she was ready to do it, but in addition to that, she was coming in every two weeks, and we would talk about different coping skills. She tried lots of times to quit, including cold turkey. Yeah, that didn't go well. <laughs> that didn't go well at all. Only last maybe three days at the most. All the while, her kids kept encouraging her to try again. It doesn't matter how many times you've tried in the past, because I have tried a lot. Try one more time and get the help you need. Don't try to do it alone. Family practice physician Mark Wendling offers additional incentive. More people are quitters today in this country, former smokers, than current smokers. I don't even have the urge to smoke now, which is good. It's really good. So there's a lot of success, and you can use people who have successfully quit to help you. Uh, so the more of us that help each other, the more successfully we'll beat this. And beat all the health problems that come with it. For Tempo and Depth, I'm Grover Silcox reporting. Thanks so much, Grover. Well, joining me now, thoracic surgeon Dr. Matthew Poots from St. Luke's University Health Network. Dr. Poots, thanks so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. You know, we saw in that story someone working towards stopping and quitting, but there's so many good reasons to quit and lots of medical reasons. Some happen immediately, some happen over time. Right, Talk with right, us about right. it. Right, now that's a great question. People always ask me that. Some of the immediate effects, as soon as you um, stop your last cigarette, 10 to 20 minutes later, your heart rate improves, decreases, your blood pressure decreases and improves, um, and so it's phenomenal. In 10 to 20 minutes? 10 to 20 minutes. Amazing. Then as you go 12 hours out, now people who smoke have more carbon monoxide in their bloodstream, which affects uh, oxygen delivery to the tissues. 12 hours, that's normalized, so your oxygen levels are improved, so that's phenomenal. In a roughly two days, our nerve endings and our taste buds um, and our sense of smell improves. Because that's another thing. People who smoke, a lot of people don't talk about it. Food doesn't taste as vibrant correct, correct, as it correct. does to the non-smoker. Correct. And that eventually all comes back in a short time, two months. And then really at one month, um, even more benefits um, are, are seen. There's improved blood flow to the air sacs where we exchange oxygen. Um, and, the, and the little hair cells that we have within our lungs start working again because they've been kind of shut down from the cigarette. And that is uh, provides tremendous amount of health benefits. One, you can breathe better. Um, shortness of breath goes away. 
Um, people can exercise. They feel less fatigued. So some of so those are some of the in immediate benefits, you know, in a short time frame in just a month. Then as we get farther out, at you know, one year, um, our risk of heart disease is essentially cut in half, you know, compared to people who are still smokers. Uh, at five years, our stroke rate um, essentially comes back to normal, as if they were never smokers or had never smoked. Ten years out, the risk of lung cancer is basically cut in half um, versus patients who continue to smoke. Uh, and then at 15 years, your risk of heart disease essentially goes down to normal, uh, again, as if you had never smoked. And, you know, the statistic that we heard earlier that, um, you know, 14 years, people lose basically 14 years of their life who smoke can kind of recover that. Um, so those are some of the, the dramatic effects. And overall, at the end of all that, people just feel better in general. And again, tobacco really affects, you know, every organ in the body uh, at the end of the day. And that's, that's the important thing to remember. I think it's difficult for a lot of people. They just think of the tobacco-related cancers. They think of, you know, the throat cancer. They think of lung cancer. But they don't think of heart disease. Correct. You Correct. know, how do we help get that message out uh, that you're not just, you know, that risk. Cancer seems like Russian roulette to me. Mm -hmm. You know, someone's put a gun, mm -hmm. loaded it with one bullet, they pull the trigger, right. Joe may get it, five other people don't. Correct, correct. But it's terrifying. Correct. I don't correct. know that it's worth the risk. I don't like Russian roulette, you know? Correct, no, neither do I. And I try to, you know, tell, impress upon, you know, everyone I meet, my patients, that it's really, it's just, you know, I, I'm a thoracic surgeon, I deal with a lot of lung cancer patients, but it really affects their whole body. Um, and the four leading causes, you know, of, of deaths in the U.S., as you mentioned, heart disease is number one, followed by cancers. And again, cancers, again, lung cancer is a big one, but throat, mouth cancer is big. Um, it affects the esophageal cancer risk, you know, stomach cancer, um, bladder, kidney, uh, cervix, you name it. Um, it has a lot of cancer effects. And then under that is what we call COPD or emphysema and all the lung diseases. Um, chronic bronchitis is more common in smokers. Pneumonias are more common. Um, and then the risk of stroke um, is, is, you know, the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. So, and on top of that, peripheral vascular disease, poor circulation to, you know, our legs, you know, higher risk of amputations. Um, people can have, you know, gum disease uh, who smoke. Um, so there's, there's a vast array of, of you know, other diseases um, that are out there um, that are very common. Do you see devastating effects like we saw in Christine earlier? Do you see a lot of that? Or are there more people who are just dying from it and don't even have the luck of being able to survive? Well, there are. There are a lot of people who just die from it and don't have that chance, um, unfortunately. Um, and and 440,000 people die each year to tobacco-related um, uh, deaths. Another staggering number is there's basically $193 billion spent on tobacco-related diseases from, from treating patients for the diseases um, and then just loss of productivity. Um, so that's just a staggering amount of money that we spend each year on, you know, health costs related to tobacco. What do you see as the most effective tool to kick in the habit? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, everyone's different, and everyone who I see in my office, I tell them it's, it, it, it takes most, multiple steps. And when we talk about uh, tobacco addiction, it's really nicotine is, is the, you know, the drug that we're addicted to within uh, cigarettes. But it's you also said it only takes a few days to break the nicotine addiction it itself, the but the habit is the killer. Correct. The habit is the killer. It takes 100 hours for the nicotine to kind of break that addiction, but then the habit is always there. And that you have to also concentrate on. It, it's, you know, and that's a lot of the psychological preparation that goes into stopping. You, know, you can take all the um, uh, nicotine replacement products that we have, the patches, the gums, but if you're not prepared for it mentally, um, to break that habit, it's difficult. Um, and that's where it becomes important to really get into some type of counseling, um, some type of behavioral therapy, talk to your primary care um, doctor and ask for advice, um, or, you know, go to a um, therapist that, you know, St. Luke's offers um, just to help because the habit is going to be the hard part of, and you have to exchange those cigarettes for some other habit. A better um, habit. A better, healthier habit. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Exercise. Exercise. <laughs> well, talk, and a lot of it is the people we hang out with. 
So we saw in the story during uh, the Super Bowl, Correct. the gentleman had a little backtrack and yeah. fell back into yeah. some old habits yeah. because he saw yeah. it. So if you yeah. hang out with folks who smoke, yeah. you kind of got to find some new friends. And, and that's an important point. I, I, you know, I ask every patient who I'm going to operate on if their spouse smokes. Because if I'm asking the patient to stop and they go home, but their significant other still smokes, guess what? Their chances of quitting are going to be much less. So that's a, a, a very critical key. Dr. Poots, I'm sorry we're out of time. From University uh, St. Luke's University Health Network, thank you so much for your information. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, we'd like to leave you with some resources to help you kick the dirty habit tonight. At BeTobaccoFree.gov, you can learn more about the health impacts of smoking from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Click on Don't Start to find resources and parents and for parents and teachers. Well, you can learn more about the prevention programs and events available here in our region at TobaccoFreeNE.com. And finally, take the first steps to quit at Smokefree.gov. You can chat with an expert and find a step-by-step -step guide to quit. Well, to keep you up to date with our new episodes and the events happening at the station, we want to encourage you to like us on Facebook. You can friend me at Amy Burkett, and you can like our station page at PBS 39. We'd love your feedback on tonight's show, and please share how you kicked the habit if you've stopped smoking. Remember, it's never too late to quit. And our experts say, if you relapse, just try again. Keep trying. It takes some people 10 times or more before they go smoke-free, but you can do it. Just take one day at a time. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope to see you in our studio audience real soon. Good night. feel privileged to bring this programming to you. By supporting education and the arts, Air Products strives to improve the quality of life here in the Lehigh Valley, where we call home. How'd you like to be part of a studio audience for a live taping of Tempo and Depth? Join us at the PBS 39 Public Media and Education Center on the Steel Stacks campus in Bethlehem. For free tickets and information, 610-867-4677, extension 333, or go online to tempo.wlvt.org. I hope to see you soon. In 1948, John Walson put an antenna on top of a mountain and ran a cable back to his television store. Cable TV was born. Now, over 60 years later, his vision has changed the way we get our information from super high-speed internet